Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome you all to this next lecture in the paper which is titled uh, Democratic Processes and Social Movements in India. This lecture is titled as Political Parties and Party System in India. As the title itself suggests, we will try to figure out in this lecture that how over a period of time a particular kind of political system has emerged in India around the conception of political party. We all are aware of the fact that political parties in any democracy have a very important role to play. That role centers around articulating the voices of diverse sections of the society to giving it a particular kind of shape and meaning for the political system to process it and to translate it into certain kind of policies. Not only this. In democracy, political parties have very significant role to play in terms of making people aware of the emerging issues, to make them aware of the problems the society is facing, also to make aware of people that how over a period of time, things like economic, social or political realm are transforming. Political parties also play very key, significant role in terms of providing new opportunities to different sections of the society in terms of changing their views, in terms of adopting to the new political, social and economic realities. Political parties also play significant role in terms of contributing to the overall political culture of any country in a democratic society. As we all also know that in this paper we are trying to figure out that how over a period of time a certain kind of political culture has evolved into India vis-a-vis -vis democratization, the process through which people have learned over a period of time to adopt to the new political realities to understand and make sense of the promises in the constitution and also how to articulate their grievances to the political institutions including the state and the government so that they can live a meaningful life in the political society of India. To start with, political parties are the agency and mechanisms through which power is organized and exercised in democracy. In other words, the role of political parties in organizing and aggregating diverse interest, interest is of a lot of significance. Not only this, political parties also give the creative voice to different kinds of voices which are there in the society. In other words, political parties not only aggregate the voices, but they also translate the voices into meaningful political nomenclatures or terms so that the government, the state and bureaucracy can translate it into policy making. In the Indian context, we all know that post-independent India had successive general elections and state elections at diverse levels and different decades. Barring two years of emergency from 1975 to 77, we had a very successful instinct of democracy so far in last 75 years. In addition, we also know that India as a diverse country has multilinguistic groups has different castes, different regions, different religions and thus we can safely say that Indian democracy is diverse, it's vibrant. In addition to that, Indian democracy is also constantly churning out new kinds of political agendas and new kind of political processes to accommodate and make sense of the diversity which is India's natural gift. It is in this context that in this lecture, we will try to figure out 
that how over a period of time political parties have given when to or given shape to the political aspirations of people. In order to make sense of and understand this whole process, one need to go a little back in terms of the pre-independence political situation in India to make sense that how it translated into a different kind of political environment in the post-independent India. In the pre-colonial, in the colonial time, pre-independence time, we all know that with the advent of Britishers, a new kind of politics started making sense. That new kind of politics was largely driven around this process of modernization of the society and coming of the modern ideas within the social, economic and political realms. One of the significant feature of this kind of exercise was that for the first time, the idea of constitution, the idea of independent country, independent government and independent constitution based on the modern liberal principles of liberty, equality, justice and rights came into the language of political class in India. People over a period of time realized that despite the fact that British Empire is playing some positive role in terms of transforming and changing the basic structures of the Indian society and providing certain modern ideas. But the fact is that India remained a backward country in terms of economic, in, in terms of its socio-cultural practices. And moreover, India remained a subjugated country ruled by the Britishers. Eventually, a political part, a party, an organization emerged by the name Indian National Congress in 1885. And we saw that eventually this particular organization started articulating the people's aspiration, people's choice for freedom over a period of time. And by 1920s, when Gandhi came to India in 1915, Congress was already an established organization. But the limits of that organization was that the party was still struggling in terms of moderate versus extremists. More so, there was no clear agenda of Congress at that point of time in terms of bargaining with the British Empire. It is only with the coming of Gandhi and converting the Congress into a mass organization that a new chapter in the independence movement started in India. Gradually, in response to the growing dominance of Gandhi and of the Congress party over the people of India that British started taking cognizance of the limits and problems of their root in India. Slowly, it happened so that with the articulation of the voices from the different sections of the people, that for the first time we find that other political parties also started emerging on the Indian political environment. Communist Party of India, Hindu Mahasabha, Muslim Leagues, and various other, other political parties, Swaraj Party, and others also came out with their own agenda of articulating the diverse sections of the society. And thus we see that over a period of time, by 1947, India already had more than a dozen political parties which were contesting and trying to figure out that how to make sense of the problems of Indian politics and how to solve the issues which the common people are suffering in India due to British rule. And thus we see that by 1947, it was almost well established that once India will enter into the post-independent phase and the elections are going to take place in 1951, that India will have multi-party system because already various political parties as I named them, have established their credentials among the common people. And it was for sure that those parties are going to contest the election in order to propagate their agenda and in order to ask for vote from the people. One can go through two explanations of party system in democracy in general. Broadly speaking, two classes of explanation for configuration of party system in democracy could be counted as first, 
the social cleavage theory of party system. According to this system, the social cleavage postulates that the party system will reflect the principal cleavages in society as for example between capital and labor in ethnoculturally homogeneous industrialized societies or as in Indian cultural milieu caste cleavage. Similarly, so let me first explain the first one. The social cleavage theory about the party system argues that whatever the most important or crucial cleavage or the binary in the society is in terms of either class or in terms of caste in the Indian context that will always get reflected in the party system in that particular country. So for instance, in a homogeneous societies like the West, the European countries or in America, where the caste is not the key issue, but the class is, we find that there are political parties which articulate the vices of people in terms of who belongs to which class of the citizens. Similarly, in the Indian context, if we apply the social cleavage theory, we find that because of the diversities of different caste, that we have caste representative political parties who are always in the fray and they contest the elections in order to argue the case for their own respective castes. The other theory which talks about the party system in India or across the world is what we identify as the political systematic theory of party system. It, according to which theorizing is based on division of powers among various levels of government being an influential recent development. Now, this kind of theory, which is very recent one, argues that because of the certain kind of systematic party system within the political structure that we find that divisions of power takes place within the government and various levels of government and accordingly different kinds of parties emerge. So for instance, you may understand this in terms of national parties and the federal parties or regional parties which are there ruling in different states. Coming to the party system in India and its evolution, we need to keep at the back of our mind a few things to start with. After independence, India opted for first past the post, in short it is called FPTP system. As we all know, the FPTP system stands for certain kind of electoral practice or politics in which every constituency, the identified constituencies for the Lok Sabha elections or for Vidhan Sabha elections have multiple candidates and the one candidate who gets the maximum vote will be declared as the winner. Here, it is not necessary that the winning election, the winning candidate needs to have more than 50%. So out of say four candidates contesting in a, on a seat and there are 100 votes, if a candidate gets 30 votes or 40 votes and the rest of them are getting 20, 25 around. So the one who gets 30 or 40 votes will be declared winner if he gets the maximum. From 1952 to 1967 is considered as the Congress dominance and Congress system. This famous idea about the one party dominance of the Congress as it is called as the Congress system which worked in the Indian context from 1952 to 1967 was termed by a famous political scientist Rajni Kothari. According to him, as we all know that in 1952, 1957 and 1962, Congress won three consecutive elections with two-third majority. What was interesting about this one party dominance and what we call as the con Congress system was that despite the fact that the opposition was very weak during this whole phase when Congress was the dominant single party, but there was the system of opposition within the Congress itself, which was articulating a whole lot of voices, which otherwise, the because of the absence of opposition parties in India, in the Indian political system, would not have been heard. And thus, that system worked for almost one and a half decades without any major challenge for precise reason 
that there was this idea of opposition working within the Congress and thus balancing the whole framework of power distribution in a democracy like India. From there on, the political system in India in terms of organization of political parties moved to the next phase that is called bipolarization of the state party system from 1967 to 1989. In this, you will find that by 1967, election marked a break with the Congress winning only 283 seats on the basis of its lowest ever vote share of 40.8%. Thus, you can see that in, by 1967, and as I have discussed in my previous lectures also, that 1960s was one of the most exciting, most challenging phase for Indian democracy immediately after almost one and a half decade. In 1962, China attacked India. In 1965, there was a scuffle between India and Pakistan. There was this problem of planning and the economic crisis in India. There was food crisis. Wheat was imported from the US. And amidst all this, there was this political instability cropping up because Congress lost elections in nine states in northern India and in Tamil Nadu. And it was in this context that for the first time, the dominant Congress system or dominance of one party was challenged within the Indian democracy. Various regional parties emerged and a new chapter in the Indian political system emerged. This chapter continued for almost three decades till 1989. In this, despite the fact that Congress continued to be at the center in terms of its majority, by, from 1977 to 1979, to which we will come later, Congress was there in the power, but other than that, in various states, Congress lost its control and various regional parties emerged. It was during this phase also that communist parties gained a lot of ground and they formed governments in West Bengal, in Tripura, and in Kerala. In post-1967 period, also saw a variety of important delinking of parliamentary and state assembly elections. And this is another important aspect of understanding or making sense of the whole political process in India, where we find that by 1967, there started the delinking between the parliamentary elections and the state elections for the first time, in the sense that it happened so far the first time after 1952, the first general elections, that till 1967, all the parliamentary and the state assembly elections were taking place simultaneously. But because of the instabilities in different states, that it, hap it happened so that state elections started taking place either before or after the general elections, and that impacted the dominance of Congress to great an extent. Congress lost power in eight out of the 16 states in this election in 1967. It also saw the emergence of anti-Congress alliances. So for the first time, for instance, in Goro, in Uttar Pradesh, it happened so that various political parties who were otherwise in opposition to each other, for instance, the uh, Communist Party and the Jansang, they came together to form the government against the Congress. Then, of a principal opposition party to the Congress in states after state, in most states representing a consolidation of non-Congress space at the state level. 1967 also brought this idea of consolidation of opposition parties and also replacing Congress in, in various state elections leading to turning the chair in terms of Congress now acquiring the opposition bench and those parties who were sitting for long in the opposition, they became part of the government. Though in 1971, Congress won the elections by almost two-third majority under the leadership of Mrs. Gandhi. And it was it during this election only that the famous slogan of Garibi Hatao or remove poverty, which worked for the benefit of 
the Congress. But within a short span, there was this India-Pakistan War of 1971. Indirectly, it helped Indira Gandhi to consolidate her position within the Indian political system. But eventually, it happened so that her growing power led to the acute crisis of Indian democracy for the first time in 1975, which translated into imposition of emergency. However, retrospectively, the post-1967 period represents a secular decline in Congress strength nationally and in, and in the states after a state. And this kind of decline, on the one hand, of course, was something which was negative for a party like Congress, which had contributed so much during the Indian struggle and India's national movement. But on the other hand, it also shows a kind of resurgence of democratic practices in India in the sense that various new groups, various new political organizations emerged during this period and they started giving enough confidence to different sections of the society, including the lower caste and lower class people to vent out their anxieties, their concerns and share their problems with the political system in India. In various ways, 1960s and 70s, eventually started translating the problems of the common people and also gave shape to creative expressions of these people. Neera Chandok, a political scientist, in her writing argues that the institutionalization of democracy, however, tends to breed its own logic and are foreseen results. Now, this statement is very interesting and one need to explain it further that how over a period of time with institutionalization of democracy there tends to be its own logic and unforeseen results. She gives example of India as no exception where she shows that in late 1960s and 1970s the Congress system imploded. In the 1967 elections sections of the party broke away. So there was this partition within the party and Congress O and Congress I were formed with their own regional parties competed in state elections and won. Congress lost control of state politics and it has never been able to regain complete power over the country since then. More seriously, in the 1970s, under the charismatic leadership of Indira Gandhi, the party atrophied organizationally. But as I have already underlined, that despite the fact that Indira Gandhi won, in terms of the organizational strength of Congress, it remained weak. The charisma of Mrs. Gandhi worked for it in one election, but after that, Congress went for decline. And it happened so rapidly that by the time 1975, Indira Gandhi realized that if she will not be able to continue in power and thus she imposed emergency. In 1971 elections, Mrs. Gandhi appealed to the national electorate across regions, caste, religion, and gender on the populist platform of remove poverty or Garibi Hatao. The federal nature of decision making within the party yielded to a highly centralized form of policy making under a charismatic leader. Thus, we can see that the Congress, which was otherwise working for almost 100 years in the Indian political system on the basis of, of federal structure suddenly started working around the idea of very high-handed centralized leadership where Mrs. Gandhi's charisma started working as the superimposed power over the different structures of power within the party and the federal and the district structure of the Congress was sidelined over a period of time. In 1977, post-emergency, Congress lost to the United Opposition, but within three years made the comeback under the leadership of Indira Gandhi. But no more Congress was the same. By 1984 elections, another exceptional election is because of the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi that Congress won highest ever vote percentage of 48.1% and 415 seats or almost three quarters of majority. 
but one need to be a little careful in terms of making sense of these kind of developments. As I have already mentioned that it was an exceptional election. Yes, it is true that Rajiv Gandhi won the 1984 election by a huge majority in terms of 48.1% vote and 415 seats. But on the other hand, this is also true that by this time, the political system in India was no more as it used to be in 1960s and 70s. New voices were already knocking on the door of the parliament. New voices had started articulating their voices. There were regional aspirations emerging. Later on, not only Jammu and Kashmir problem, but also Punjab crisis, Assam crisis, in many other states in Northeast, they started challenging the dominant structures of political system in India, which was largely centered around one party dominance of Congress and thus center say in the state politics. Coming to the next, that is political parties in India in the post-independence, we find that a few theorists have tried to figure out that how political system and the party system worked in the post-independent India. Political parties, as we know, are considered as the linkages between the institutions and the constituencies within the polity. It is in this context, one need to also understand that the crucial connection between political processes and policy makers are ensured by the political parties. James Menor has written uh, extensively on this process of how political parties articulate different grievances and give shape to them in the form of policy making as political parties provide the feedback to the government and the state. Zoya Hassan in one of her writings argues that there were two different phases in the party system in India. The first in which she argues that one party dominance was there of Congress. After that, she talks about the greater democratization and opening of political system. So now if you go back to what I have discussed so far in this lecture, then and we apply what Zoya Hassan is talking about, then she has this clear understanding and idea that till 1967, yes, it was one party dominance of Congress. But after them, what happened, what translated within the party systems in India, she is terming it as greater democratization and opening of political system. So in one sense, she is celebrating this whole process of decline of dominance of Congress and coming of, of various political parties within the Indian political system as according to Hassan, it enriched the political environment and led to further democratization of political processes in India. Zoya also underlines two contradictory phenomena that parties as key to democratization or deepening of democracy on the one hand. On the other hand, she also underlines that lack of a strong organizational structure or internal democracy and mobilize support along ethnic lines. Now these two points are very interesting in the context of Indian political system so far that Zoya Hassan argues that on the one hand, the two contradictory processes are happening in the Indian democracy vis-a-vis -vis political parties. On the one hand, the parties are playing very crucial and important role in terms of democratization of the society and deepening of democracy in India, making it to reach to the grassroots level. On the other hand, she argues that the political parties have also played significant role in terms of choking democracy within the organization as they fail to democratize the internal mechanism or internal working of their own organization. And they fail to mobilize people from all sections of the society as they rely more and more on invoking the uh, supporters and invoking the voters along the ethnic line. Similarly, if you move to uh, make sense of the regional political parties and their typology, we find that regional parties in various states after the decline of Congress system emerged. And these regional parties were of course diverse, not only in on the basis of castes or in terms of different regions, but also in terms of linguistic practices. Thus, we find that parties like DMK and AIA DMK 
on the one hand championing the politics of caste in their respective state of Tamil Nadu, but also they were betting for Tamil as the language of their politics. Similarly, in Maharashtra, the rise of Shiv Sena and other such outfits in other states shows that diverse issues were articulated by regional parties, which were otherwise so far were accommodated by the dominance of one party, that is Congress. In North India, multi-state regional parties also emerged. So, for example, Samajwadi Party, RJD, BSP, JDU, and various other parties emerged in the states of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. In the regional ethnic, if we go by the regional ethnic characters, we find that Telugu Desam Party in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, DMK and AIDMK in Tamil Nadu, Assam Garbhasad in Assam, and various other parties of ethnic nature also emerged in different regions and they championed the regional diversities. By 1980s, various significant changes took place within the party system in India. To start with, in the 1980s, two events of considerable magnitude transformed the party system in India as new agendas filled the space vacated by Congress party. The BJP, which was at that time, was more or less marginal to Indian politics. It gained two seats so far. So, as you see that in 1980s, of course, the decline of Congress was, though it was arrested for one election in 1984, but the decline continued even after that. And in 1989, Congress lost to Janata Dal and other coalition partners in opposition. The new vacuum was, which was getting created by the decline of Congress was gradually filled by the rise of the BJP, which had on, won only two seats in 1984, but soon by 1989 election, it made its presence felt at least in North India. At the same time, the BJP's rise was challenged by caste-based party. So, as we can see, if we have to underline two significant events or changes in 1980s, one of course is decline of Congress and rise of BJP, but also to is the fact that another significant event which is happening during this phase is that the rise of BJP itself is getting challenged by the rise of regional parties which are championing the politics of caste. These parties challenge the idea that the Hindu community was a homogeneous or unified entity. Hinduism is hierarchically organized on the basis of caste and some of these caste groups such as Dalits and the backwards had been excluded from cultural, social and economic life by a complex system of hierarchy. Now the argument as you can see in the second point is very clear that once these new regional parties emerged who started championing the politics of caste, their argument was that despite the fact that what BJP is claiming as Hindu uh, party, the fact is that the Hindu society is divided along diverse caste and thus those castes are, needs to be, the problem of those caste community needs to be articulated. Because BJP fails to do that, the other regional parties which are caste based parties, they have every right to do the same and thus how you find that parties under the leadership of leaders like Lalu Prasad Yadav or Mulayam Singh or Mayati or Kansi Ram emerged in North India and they challenged the formidable rise of the BJP in 1990s. Since the 1990s, India seemed to have entered into the post-Congress phase of its political history. Now one need to underline and understand that why is it called as the post-Congress phase? As I have already stated that in 1950s and 60s, the, of course the Congress was the one party dominant system and thus there was no question of post-Congress. From 1967 to 1989, again this is true that Congress was on the decline but as I have already mentioned that barring those four or five years from 1975 to 1980s, the Congress was always at the center of all the political formations and it continued its majority. It is only for the first time in 1989 
after the debacle of 1977 that the Congress lost elections and the power in the center. And thus, finally, since then, we are now in 2022 that so far the Congress has failed to win the election on its own. And gradually it happened so that Indian political system turned into what we can call as post Congress phase of its political history. The fate of the dominant party of yesteryear appeared to be sealed for good. It had lost its capacity to rally disparate groups that were sometimes pull apart, like upper caste, Dalits, and Muslims under its banner. As I have discussed in other lecture that till 1967 or even after that for very long time congress used to represent two pull apart sections of the society within their own party that was the upper caste hindus as well as the dalits along with that congress was also representative of muslim sections of the society as well as christians it happened for the first time in 1989 that Congress lost its credibility among not only Muslims but also among the lower caste Hindus as well as among the upper caste Brahmins. And eventually, the upper caste shifted towards the BJP, the lower caste Dalit shifted towards parties like RJD or Janata Dal and BSP and Samajwadi Party. And similarly, Muslims also decided to move away from Congress and Eventually, Congress lost the plot. Until the early 90s, the Congress party's formula for electoral dominance had rallied on its capacity to encompass contending social groups. It was a genuine catch-all political party. In 1967, general election, for example, voting for the Congress party hardly varied among different income levels. In North India, it was more specifically based on coalition of extremes, to borrow a phrase from Paul Varas. What I explained to you in terms of bringing the whole apart social, social classes of the society, that is upper caste and the lower caste together under one umbrella in Congress, the famous political scientist Paul Varas calls this as the coalition of extremes, that is the extremes of the social milieu of Indian societies, that is upper caste and lower caste, both were brought under one coalition within the Congress dominance. But that dominance broke in 1967 and gradually Congress lost its control over that and eventually translated into certain kind of new political environment and situation in which new parties rose to the helm. Its principal support came from Brahmins, the scheduled cards and Muslims. Now the parties are straddled two cleavages. One separating the high and low caste and thus separating India's two largest religious communities. The same general strategy was successful in other regions as well. So if you see the elections before 1989, we find that the Congress succeeded in ensuring the coalition between diverse religious groups as well as caste groups. But that magic of Congress eventually waded away and the coalition collapsed. And with that, the fate of Congress also got sealed. The 1990s witnessed a diminution of Congress party's attraction among all these sectors. The BJP and large number of regional parties were the chief beneficiaries of the decline of the Congress, as well as the disintegration of the social coalition that sustained the Congress party's previous electoral success. And if the Congress could not play the role of catch-all party anymore, some argued that national character of Indian politics could be significantly changed with the prevalence of regional powers and interest over national ones. Now, because of this decline of Congress party, which was a centrist party for very long, and interestingly, it was in power in the center as well as in, in the uh, different regions or, or different states. It happened so by late 1980s that since Congress lost many states and also eventually lost power in the center, that various regional parties came to prominence and they came together to form the coalition government, that for the first time, social scientists started arguing that it may happen so that the national interest of the, of the country 
will get compromised and the regional aspirations and regional interest will take over. As such, we do not have the black and white answer to this situation that whether it will be good for the democracy or bad for the democracy, it can go both ways. And eventually it happened so that in 1990s, the rise of the BJP as the party which was in control in the center, but had the coalition with the regional parties that a new kind of balance was achieved. We will see this in the next part of the lecture. Thus, despite all this, Congress made a comeback in 2004 and 9, but it was more of a coalition government anchoring and on Congress. I will cover this part again later part. Coming to the 1990s, and as I have discussed, that a new chapter of regionalization of electoral politics started taking shape from 1990s to 2014. The regionalization of politics also definitely helped the Congress party to win the 2009 general elections. The party benefited from this phenomena in three distinct ways. Let me first spend a few minutes on uh, understanding uh, the politics which emerged in 1990s and the decade of 2000 to make sense of that how and in what situation eventually UPA government formed under the leadership of Manmohan Singh. In 1990s, as we all are aware of the fact that under the after the decline of Congress and the loss of the election in 1989, that the coalition government under the leadership of VP Singh and later of Chandrasekhar was formed. But they were very unstable governments. Congress again made the comeback in 1991, this time under the leadership of P.V. Narasimha Rao. But it happened so that Congress failed to get the majority on its own. It seats over around 218 or 20 and they had to manage with other coalition partners. And thus, a new era of coalition government started in 1990s. This government, particular government under the leadership of Narasimha Rao continued for five years, but it was marred with a whole lot of the issues of corruption, etc. And eventually, in the 1996 election, Congress lost badly. This time, now for the Again, the regional parties came together, Janata Dal was at the core and the new coalition government was formed under the leadership of the Prime Ministership of Indra Kumar Gujarat. But again, it proved to be unstable. Then a new Prime Minister replaced him, Devagora. Then again, that government also failed to complete its tenure. And in a very short span of two years, again, the election took place in 1998. Under and this time, under the leadership of Atal Bihari Bajpayee, that for the first time a truly non Congress government was formed at the center. This was again the coalition government in which the BJP was the biggest party, but this government also could not complete its tenure. And within one year, election took place in 1999. But by now, BJP had consolidated its position and it emerged as the largest party though still short of majority and formed a stable coalition government for five years but within this five years again a whole lot of churning started taking place within the society because of the impact of globalization etc and bjp lost the people's imagination it failed to capture people's imagination for the second term and a new government was formed under the leadership of Manmohan Singh. Thus, you can see that there was a return of Congress for after almost a decade. And UPA first government was formed and Manmohan Singh was designated as the Prime Minister. The representation of various regional parties in the central government, regional leaders shared the power with the national parties like the Congress and BJP. Now it, ha it happened so that during this whole phase, from 1990s to the decade of 2010 till 2014 that various regional parties and their regional leaders joined the central government and they shared the power with the national parties like Congress and BJP during different governments and thus the voices of the regional parties and regional aspirations got accommodated in the central cabinet. But we find that 
2014 onwards a new era of party system in india has evolved and people are arguing that whether we are now entering into a new one party dominance first let's spend a couple of minutes on understanding this whole idea of one party dominance the phrase the one party dominant system was originally fashioned or coined by the noted political scientist rajni kothari to capture a phenomena peculiar to electoral politics in india and to congress party in particular and that was as i have discussed in detail was the phase from 1951-52 to 1967 when congress was the single largest party and there was not much scope for any opposition party kothari in his writings argued that indian democracy from the negative connotation attached to one party rule in closed and authoritarian system he he suggested that the congress was an umbrella party a coalition of interest groups that often opposed each other within the party as i have discussed already this point that when we use this term one party dominance that doesn't mean that there was a kind of authoritarian power structure in the country what rajni kothari is trying to argue is that it was a unique kind of democratic system within which of course one political party was dominant to the extent that no opposition no formidable opposition was present in the government in the political system but on the other hand this is also true that it got balanced the absence of coalition got balanced by the presence of the dissenting voices within the ruling party that is the congress and that's how it is strengthened and enriched the whole political system and party system in india party decisions were therefore the outcome of compromise between different and incommensurate views posed through intricate processes of mediation and arbitration within the party thus as you can see that kothari is highlighting that how within the party at different levels and the level of organization and government mediation and arbitration used to take place so that a, form, a meaningful consensus can be reached and thus the opposition was there not outside but within the party and even if it was not significantly present in the parliament that doesn't mean that the democracy was in any kind of danger according to kothari the features of one party dominant system can be underlined as follows so kothari argues that one party dominant system will always have an open and competitive party system as working second that a fractured opposition that cannot provide an alternative to the government but which can press the government to do certain things or not do these things and third that a democratic and consensual dominant party will function now all these three important points are already being discussed in detail in this lecture i'll just reflect a few minutes on this and then we will move to the next slide according to kothari an open and competitive party system will always be there despite there will be a one party dominance and thus till 1967 despite the fact that congress was the one party dominance but that doesn't mean that the other parties were not functioning or there was any kind of ban on them and thus we know that parties like jansang and communist party of india were very much active in contesting elections similarly he argues that another important aspect of this whole process is that there will always be the opposition in the parliament the only limit of that opposition will be that it will be a very fractured opposition and thus will in not in any situation in this condition that it can replace the ruling party in the form of government and thus the party which is ruling will be relatively safe the third important aspect is that within the one party dominance there will always be the democratic and consensual nature of political system working and thus the party which is in government for long and controls the majority in the parliament will be but will always be accommodative to diverse voices and will try to figure out how best to give shape to diverse voices in the democracy 
Now keeping in view the fact that 2014 onward, India has seen an emergence of a new political system, a kind of a system which is similar to what was there in the Indian political system from 1951 to 1967 in the form of one party dominance. Thus many political scientists are arguing that are we in one party dominance kind of system because BJP has consecutively won two elections in 2014 and 19. We will try to answer this question in a minute. But let us first see that can we say that BJP is now having votes of all sections of the society and thus no more the old idea of organizing the politics around caste line or regional aspirations line is working. In other words, can we say that now we have de-ethnicized voting in India? Let us uh, discuss it in little detail. In India, the act of voting has always been partially overdetermined by the ethnic identity of citizens based on religion, caste, tribe or language. We all know that Indian political system because of the richness of diversities and the kind of politics which has evolved during the freedom struggle and after that, that we have political system which functions well within the larger ambit of regional identities, within the ambit of identities of linguistic groups or the caste groups or the religious groups. As the contention, contentious, as contentious as it may sound, the term ethnic voting is frequently used in the academic literature as an encompassing and convenient notion lumping together the political and mobilization process based on various ascriptive identities. Ethnic voting may sound negative, but the fact is that over a period of time in the Indian political system, this kind of voting pattern has always enriched the Indian democracy and was fruitful for various caste groups who were there to at the margins, but they teased the idea of power and they learned the language of politics by participation in 1990s and in the decades of 2000. Can we then say that post 2014, Indian political system has delinked itself from ethnic voting pattern and thus a new party based system with a very broad appeal has emerged? The answer could be both yes and no. The results of previous two elections in 2014 and 19 shows following two things. One, that the defeat of caste based parties in the election illustrates sheer impatience with the narrow agenda and the focus on handouts such as more quotas for the caste or that. In other words, as we can see, sure we can argue that the 2014 and 19 voting pattern has showed that various sections of the society who were for the last so many decades backing a political a particular political parties on the name of caste, they were almost done with them in the sense that they were no more in the mood to negotiate with those political parties further. And the argument goes that the narrow agendas of those political parties and the sole focus of only handouts in terms of providing more providing more uh, reservation was not something which various caste groups were ready to buy and thus they shifted their loyalty, they shifted their commitment towards the Bharatiya Janata Party. On, similarly, another factor that caused unease was coalition politi politics at the center. For almost two decades, the center party and the government at the center of India were formed around the coalition partners and thus there was always at times policy paralysis or at times decision paralysis. In addition, there were also issues of corruption and undue representation of various political parties or undue representation of various states and it eventually it translated into certain kind of frustration within the electorates of India and it paid benefit to the BJP which came out with this idea that it will represent the diverse voices 
and diverse regional aspirations through one single party. Moving to the last section of this lecture, we see that in the recent past, certain kind of fragmentations has, have emerged. The caste based mobilization remains at the heart of parties electoral strategies and that voting patterns show no sign of shifting towards a more issue based platform. If you look into various reports of newspapers and data provided, it is still very much clear that despite the fact that various caste organizations and caste groups have mobilized their commitment towards one party, but that does not mean that the caste politics has ended in India. And thus, this part will try to answer the no part of the question that whether we have entered into one party dominance, as I said yes and no. Yes, in terms of what I explained before, now we are trying to explain the no part of it in terms of understanding that despite the fact that one party's dominance has emerged and various caste groups have backed that party, but that does not mean that the political mobilization of various caste groups is not taking place on the name of caste. Still, all political parties are using the caste line to mobilize their voters. And instead of that, caste still remains at the center of voter choice and continues and continues to be the primary basis for political mobilization and expressions. What is different is that earlier various caste groups were negotiating and backing diverse political parties to get their work done to get their interest protected. But with the rise of the BJP, it has happened so that those diverse polit politically informed diverse caste group, they are directly now negotiating with the BJP and trying to ensure that their caste interest is taken care of by the one party. However, in the recent past, party system is undergoing certain changes in India. And polity has responded in terms of not necessarily confining to caste mobilization. But having said that, there is still the mobilization of caste is taking place. One also need to understand that along with the limitation of caste, other issues have also taken the center stage because of the kind of liberalization, privatization, and globalization which has taken place in the Indian economic system in last three decades or so that the it has translated into significantly changing the social milieu of the society, the aspirations of the people, the emergence of the new middle class. And this emergence of the new middle class is not limited only to the upper class, but also within the middle caste and lower caste people, there is a rise of relatively better off middle class people and their aspirations, their choices, their need, and their political vocabulary is significantly different from many other sections of the society. In the recent UP elections in 2017 and 19, we can easily see that how diverse caste groups who were historically aligned towards Samajwadi Party or Bhujan Samajwadi Party, they have moved towards the BJP, keeping that fact in mind. Finally. The withering away of the Congress umbrella and its social coalition, Brahmins, Dalit, and Muslims gave rise to new alliances represented by the caste and community based parties. This led to the institutionalization of caste based fragmentation and exponential growth of BSP and SP in, in, in the latter part, but eventually it happened so that BJP emerged and it contributed significantly in terms of giving voice to the people's need. Thank you.